Sorry. Welcome, everybody. Everybody's locking in. Always great to see you. Thank, Thank you, you for too, coming. Rabbi. I can't put up with you. That's okay. Me. I'll get it. Appreciate it. Thanks for starting it. Um, I'm going to get the sheet up for Zoom, but a question as we begin. Um, today we're going to talk about no. <laughs> That was a perfect segue. It's not and, enough for you, is it? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, More than I want. Yeah. Snow and rain and the interconnectivity of all things. So the question to chew on as I get the sheet up is, uh, how, what? So to speak. <laughs> so to speak, right. To chew on, lunch and lark. Um, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you see rain and snow in the context of the interconnectivity of all things? as symbols uh, or, or literal devices of, for that. Uh, let me get the sheet up. Rain, I know. I grew up with snow. But snow, I I thought it was going to get warm. No, but it means I pick this topic. Oh, funny. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Katie. How you doing? Okay, so does anybody have some, some initial thoughts? Yes. We need rain and snow and water to preserve guys, what's life, mm -hmm. to grow our food and to um and to ski. And obviously the Torah yeah, is the tree of life and, and the water and all of that. So I mean, but basically rain and snow supports life. Okay, great. So uh, supporting, literally supporting life with that we're dependent on rain and, and water. snow to a lesser degree, but water, right? Uh, for our survival, for the crop, for but the harvest. Too much is not. But too much is not good. So it's got to be just right. It's good. Too little is good. Out west, it's been lousy. Yes, right. So keep all of this in mind. Just yeah. right amount. Uh, but then you ended by saying one more thing that I... Before it is representative of life and the water and the water okay good so study so the tree of life yes, yes. so so the tree the torah is a tree of life which is like a tree nourished and sustained with water so maybe there's an implication uh, or a spiritual point about the interconnectivity of all things that uh, uh in order for torah to grow there needs to be rain or maybe an acknowledgement of the way in which spiritually we're all connected i think that's a really nice point any other thoughts before we jump in? It all has to be done in, in, in its season. Nice, Jackie. Everything in its season. There's a time for everything, yes. as Kohala teaches us. Please, yes. yes. And the birds. It goes more than just water mm -hmm. because of precipitation. Because there are planets that can support life, and these planets can't support life. These are too hot and too cold. Or no atmosphere, too much, too much atmosphere, you know, all those different things. Yeah. Okay. You're in this little tiny little niche. Right. Right. So just a delicate balance of the elements in order to sustain and nurture life, right? If one thing is off, it's kind of like the Asher Yatsar prayer that we say in the in the morning blessings, that if even one you know, gland or hole was blocked or not functioning correctly, we would cease to exist and be able to praise God. It's one of the first prayers we say in the morning. So similarly, that's on a on a on a micro level, but on a macro level, right? If there's not enough warmth, not enough cold, not enough water, not enough rain, right? The delicate balance with which whole ecosystems and planets can sustain life because of the of an of a, a natural cycle that works to sustain life. Good. Okay. So that's a great place to to dive in. Let's let's start now. Are we gonna? Yeah. 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 And then, well, Earth, I built the Earth, Wind, and Fire to pull them. Right. That's what I'm going to do. We'll need more seats. <laughs> um, so let's dive in. Who would like to read our first text? This is from. Uh, Bavli from the uh, Babylonian Talmud from a tractate called Ta'anit. Uh, Ta'anit is the opposite of lunch, fasting. Yeah, about fasting, and a lot of it has to do with prayers for rain in times of drought, right? Because fasting is often employed as a device to move God to compassion, right? If we fast, if we call out to God, God will have compassion and send rain. 
Um, so a lot of Tani has to do with that. And and we get the story of Foni Ame Agel. Um, this is an individual, you may, some of us may be familiar with this story. Yeah. Yes. When we used to see Yeah. I'm sure kids get a kick out of this one, um, but I think we can too. Um, so this is a story, as we'll read, about Khoni Hameagel. Hameagel is the circle drawer, the circle maker. It may also be an occupation like a roofer kind of thing, but um, in this case, it's drawing circles. So he likes to read for us. Great, right, go for it. Take it off. <laughs> the people said to Khoni Hameagel, pray that rain should fall. He said, go out and bring in Pesach ovens so they will not dissolve. He prayed and no rain fell at all. What did he do? He drew a circle on the oh, ground yeah. and stood inside it and said before God, master of the universe, your children have turned their faces toward me as I am like a member of your household. Therefore, I take an oath by your great name that I will not move from here until you have mercy upon your children and answer their prayers for rain. Rain began to trickle down in small droplets. He said, I did not ask for this, but for rain to fill the cisterns, ditches and caves. Rain began to fall furiously. He said, I did not ask for this damaging rain either, but for rain of benevolence, blessing and generosity. Subsequently, the rains fell in their standard man manner until all of the Jews went to the Temple Mount due to the rain. They came and said to him, just as you prayed over the rains that they should fall, so too pray that they should stop. Sh Shimon ben Shatar the Nasi re relayed to Honi Ma'agal, were you not Honi? I would have decreed that you be ostracized, but what can I do to you? You nag God and God does your bidding like a child who nags their parent, who does their bidding without reprimand. After all, rain fell as you requested. Mm -hmm. About you, the verse states, let your father and mother be glad and let he who bore you rejoice and let her who bore you rejoice. Good. So a couple of things here, and, and, and you guys touched on this already. One point being the sort of Goldilocks principle of too little, no good, too much, no good. It's the happy medium, which Ron also picked up on us. The delicate balance that sustains planets, Earth, right? A um, couple things of, of note that I want to elevate. One is in, in conversations of, oh, well, first this, this first bit about bringing the ovens, that just means that it's sort of like a show of his confidence, saying like, the rain's going to come, bring in the ovens so they don't get wet, which in this case, I guess they would dissolve because of their material. Um, so just sort of like being confident, but then it doesn't come. So then he does this bargaining with God, this negotiation with God, um, which seems very chutzpahit, right? It, to say, to, to employ that kind of language with God. But where have we seen that in the Torah before? Not literally drawing a circle, but but that kind of approach to... Hmm? Okay, good. So Abraham with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah saying, what if I find 50, 40, 30, 10? That's literally bargaining with God, negotiating. Um, I heard Noah. Tell me more why Noah. Oh, the rains. Oh, and right. That's a story of rain, of flooding. But but I would say that actually there's a there's a commentary, the Kedushat Levi, is it a commentary that says Noah actually failed to bargain with God, that, that he could have advocated for the people, but didn't do enough. Mm -hmm. And, and there's reasons for that. Maybe he was too little in his eyes thinking, who am I to move God? Or, or another point of, of belittling himself that he thought, if God's going to save me, I'm nobody, then God's not going to destroy the world because there are people better than me out there. But so that, that, that's sort of a commentary that comes to say, Noah, who is righteous in his generation, was not necessarily as righteous as, say, Abraham, because he didn't advocate to save, that he could have done more to save the people, if only he thought himself worthy, if only he had the chutzpah yeah. to, to, to confront God, to be a hero. Um, but it's interesting, right? I, whenever I, I read the kind of debates with God, I I almost, I, I think you could look at it in two ways or more, but one being that God needs the push to do better, which 
you can read that way because it's, you know, you could make the claim that as Jews, we don't believe God necessarily has to be infallible or perfect. But I go with the other read, which is that God wants this discussion, wants the partnership and the engagement that God is is pleased. In this case, at the end, like a parent would over their child who who agitates for what is right, for justice. Good, I've raised you well. You're 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 speaking true, and that makes me happy. Yeah. The, go ahead. It, it's interesting that in the life of our of our whole um, religion and its interaction. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, we feel comfortable talking to God. Mm -hmm. He's our friend. I mean, I'm just trying to think, is Jesus a friend, really? I'm sure there are plenty of songs that would suggest, right? Mm -hmm. You've got it. Yeah. <laughs> we're willing to debate with, and challenge, we're willing to challenge God. But yeah. You can, can you explain this last line? I know it's from uh, from Proverbs. But your father and your mother be glad, and let her who bore you rejoice. Are right. they just trying to be poetic and repeating? The mother? Yeah. You know, this is mother and father. Well, okay, we're assuming the mother. I mean, does it matter the mother bore him or not? Or Oh, yeah. So I think these tend to be, there's parallelism, as you know, yeah. right? So I, I think it's, you know, it, it is significant that it's only the mother in the second part. So you could certainly interpret and read into that however you <laughs> like. But I I think it's it's just the parallelism that that would include the father. But here it's talking about actually boring, like bearing. So I think that's why it's the mother. But but I think it's just it's a it's a poetic repetition that should mean something similar. Um, but I think the rabbis are trying to comprehend how how is it okay that you spoke to God this way. And so they have to bring a biblical verse to support what Cloney is doing. Otherwise, they would ostracize him. They would uh, um, put him in harem, right? Uh, and, and the way they do that is by bringing this verse saying, actually, this is a, a positive dynamic, like a child who, who agitates their parent, but in a way that pleases them. So they, they do the child's bidding without reprimand. Uh, Larry, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, Moses talks to God and says, I can't take this responsibility alone. Mm -hmm. So that's a question. Yeah. Great, yes. So there's that, which uh, he uses. There's actually, there's another feminine imagery there of being like a nurse to the people. Moses saying, I can't bear this people alone. Am I supposed to be like their, their nurse? Um, but but there's also this, this bargaining with God, which goes back to this interconnectivity between, in this case, God and people saying, not for our sake, right? Not for my sake, God, but for your sake. If you destroy this people, which God says, right? I'm going to start new with you, right? I'm going to wipe them out. I'll start new with you. This is after the the, the golden calf and, and the people just being so egregious. And Moses says, if you destroy the people, what will that say about you to the other nations? Mm -hmm. We'd say, oh, well, this God must not have been powerful enough because God freed them from Egypt but didn't have enough power to bring them into the land of Israel like God promised. So clearly it, God is not strong enough. So Moses is employing this bargaining technique, but say not for our sake, but for yours. Otherwise, what will people say about you? Are we constantly bargaining with God? Oh, yeah. Yes. Now, I mean, I guess that's the element of prayer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in this case, yeah, I mean, he is saying... Yeah. But, <laughs> to have compassion for your people, but that's what you would do anyway. So it's it's sort of it's speaking truth to power in a way, but saying like, be you, right? Shall not the judge of the earth judge justly? It's it's coming from a place of like this deep intimate relationship of truly knowing one another, which you could say you can't actually do with God, but there are certain characters in our text, certain heroes who have this special relationship to say, I I know who you are. And shall not the judge of the of the whole earth do justly? You, far be it from you to wipe the wicked with the good, wipe away the wicked with the good, right? So, so I think here too, Honey is saying like I, you, you, you. It is with it is in your nature, God, to to have compassion, and and save us, and God responds to that kind of a prayer here. First with too little, then too much, then just right, which is an interesting back and forth, right? But I'm going to ask. <laughs> If it isn't really like a prayer, because the first thing he did was pray, 
and sure. he got no result. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he had to like escalate it yeah. to a different prayer we think of it as, as a petitioning. Speaking of which, I have some petitions. <laughs> uh, but um, and then I know the, the feeling I get from the next sequence is mm. this is more of a demand. Mm. This isn't a this isn't a just a it's or a, I don't know if a word request is right. Yeah. It's more like a demand. It's sort of like, yeah. hey, I, you know, I'm in your household, God, and the children came to me with this request. We pray, no rain. Right. All right. And then the whole drawing the circle and, and you know, I'm not going to move until mm -hmm. you grant the read, grant the demand. That's, that's <laughs> I don't know. That seems different than what our usual convention is. Okay, good. So let me respond to this and then I'm going to get to you guys. But uh, so maybe there is a difference here between prayer and action. And maybe God, is, there are times where God responds to prayer alone, but there are other times we know that God doesn't want just prayer. God wants action. Mm -hmm. And that that brings us to your petition, right? But that, that you can't just <laughs> lay around and wait and hope that things will change, but you have to take action, right? So, so maybe it's only when he literally draws a line in the sand and says, and, and starts using the language of demanding, or is more active in his approach that that uh, uh, he's met with success here. So maybe prayer at times isn't enough. We'll go, uh, Larry. Yeah, here, then we'll go. Yeah, Larry first. Uh, Jerry, sorry, Jerry, go ahead. Um, no, I hear this, but I'm hearing all kinds of negotiations going on. What always pops into my mind is Aaron's two sons, mm -hmm. who all of a sudden are killed. Right. There's no dialogue. There's no. Let's do this. Let's do that. Aaron is involved in a discussion. So, how do you balance these two things? I think that there. It's a good point. There are times where God seems open to discussion and negotiation, and other times where not. Right. Mm -hmm. There is. I think that the the text that Rabbi Fa, Rabbi Josh brought at one point about uh, uh, Moses uh, in Rabbi or uh, Rabbi Akiva. Sorry, Moses in Rabbi Akiva's Beit Midrash. Mm -hmm. Right, and he doesn't understand anything because it's so foreign the language. Or how, it, but then he's comforted because it all is <laughs> given to Moshe at Sinai, Torah the Moshe Sinai. But then he sees what happens to this great scholar, and then he's flayed alive. And Moses says, "This is Torah, and this is its reward." <clears throat> and God says, "Stoke, right? Basically, be quiet. This is my will." So I think Jerry, that that's a good point. Sometimes it's almost like there are, you know, God is not open to that, but there are other times clearly where God is. And God is moved but by I that. Is there a lesson in that in terms of how we can interpret when there will and won't be? I think so. I think so. I mean, I think there are in the rabbinic mind some things that are just remain mystery, some things that are beyond human comprehension. So maybe that's how I would categorize it. Maybe in their mind that there are some things that are just beyond our ability to understand. But other things that that maybe are meant to be engaged with. I'd like to take yes. on to the, oh, oh, sorry, Ron, just a moment then. Yeah. So I'm just going to say it's it's not so much a negotiation, at least from this translation. But we don't know what words, what exactly he prayed for rain, but he prayed for rain. He took the line in the sand action. God sent rain. And then Tony says, no, that's wrong. <laughs> it's not like, well, how about this? And I'll beat you halfway. Like, You're wrong. You're wrong again. That's not what I wanted. Like, Good. So it's 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 really not even a negotiation. Right? It's more just Tony exerting his will. Yeah, which is nagging. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, yeah. Right. And I think that's where they need to bring this verse from Proverbs to say this is just in the end. He because he's a great scholar, and we know this from other places in the Talmud that that he could expound on things that the sages could not. So I think they're they are remiss to. Uh, incriminate him. So I think they're looking at this and saying, well, he must be in the right. How is he in the right? And then they bring this for this proverb, this this verse from Mishlei to say, well, it's it is nagging, but it's in a way that God actually ultimately desires. Right. My, my tag on to that was that God also has needs and wants. And sometimes he needs prayer and sometimes he just wants to act. Mm. Right. He's so human. human. He's probably just as human as we are. Right. I think I think that's fine. When we talk yeah. about the interconnectivity, right? That there then maybe that that's the way in which we're interconnected in the way that we're made, but Salam Elohim in the image of God. So maybe there are similarities, but 
but but I I still I I love this idea of what it, you know what is your line in the sand when do you draw that line uh, and and also what does it say that he has this circle just around him alone yes. that while he's advocating for other people there is this like solitary mano y mano with God which I want us to keep in mind as we move on to our other texts but let's let's go uh, here and then we we'll go so David and then Sheila well I mean. I think it's, I, I don't know how the story developed over time to eventually get written down this way, but it's certainly troubling that he's on the one hand demanding and on the other hand, it seems like God's playing games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm it makes trying some to it's like my like, don't go there, Rod. I'm not, I don't, at least I don't accept it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And it belittles the whole point, it seems to me. I honestly think this is very troubling in the in respect that it seems like A, a game on the one hand, and B, demanding in an inappropriate way, perhaps, on the other. So how are we supposed to understand that? So I'm struggling with it, and I'm thinking maybe of a couple of things. I don't know if they make sense, but one might be that, uh, at least in the context of the people being desperate for rain, and for whatever reason, they aren't getting it. Um, that maybe that is a time to be a little more Uh So that goes to, I guess, the extreme of what you're saying about sometimes God wants you to take a stand, whether it's in a circle or not. Yes. Uh, but the other might be um, to go back and think about whatever it was. If if, if we want to connect the dots, you know, we might say scientifically, if you will, there are all kinds of reasons for drought that aren't because of human behavior. <laughs> On the other hand, if we want to make, we want to tie this back to this and say it is because of human behavior, then maybe the game, so to speak, is to say, who's who's responsible for rain, at least by mm, right. uh, Whether it's too hard, too soft, or Geshem Shel Bracha, mm -hmm. uh, so maybe the point isn't so much that it's de the demanding side of it. Maybe the point is what's the response? Great point. So I think Ba'aretz in Israel, and then Sheila and then Nelson, I see your hands. But I think there it is sort of in the rabbinic mind and in, in our in our prayer and our liturgy comes down to human behavior, right? The, the Shema is a contract of sorts. If you yeah. behave this way, you follow my commandments, then there will be rain in its due season. Unlike Egypt, which has the Nile River, Israel does not have that major source of water that will sustain it through drought. So we're dependent on rain. There is this interconnectivity, the special relationship between God and Israel that we're de truly dependent on. God. And, and as our Shema teaches us, that's, that is contingent on our honoring the covenant and our rain, right? At least in the rabbinic imagination and in our, our Torah, right? That it's, it's sort of it, our merit. We merit the rain. Um, so maybe ultimately that's what it's getting at. And I just want to say, as you're talking, it makes me think of how this, maybe this game, so to speak, which I hear you on one hand, the demanding nature is no good. On the other hand, the, the game kind of seems unfair. So I see like, is any, why is this the dynamic? It seems sort of unhealthy on both sides. But what's interesting is it ultimately gets us to the temple mount, right? The, the rain, uh, which, which is the, then the right amount, it's the right level of rain, but it goes on for too long. Maybe, maybe that's also a point about what we think we can understand and meddle with when it's actually beyond our ability to, right? We think that we can push the levers of rain and say, we need this here, push this lever when God is saying, okay, fine, you want it here, but it's not going to go well for you. Kind of like the Edgar Allan Poe, the monkey paw, right? Be careful what you wish for. You don't actually, right? You, you don't have the ability to, to run the world the way we may believe that God does, right? So, um, so but, but, but it ultimately gets them to the Temple Mount. So maybe if this is a game, Oh. The, the end result, is, and, and the reason here is just logistics, that it's the highest point, right? So that they're they're like the Noah's Ark kind of thing, yeah, saving yeah. them from the flood. Yeah. So maybe it's prayer. Like maybe yeah. maybe that's a point that God ultimately wants this closeness that that is evoked by being on the Temple Mount and the special mm -hmm. connections. So maybe it's relationship that God is after, behavior. I think those are all interesting points. I mean, it also relates a little bit, bringing back the science uh, you know, it's not a competition between science and faith, so to speak, mm -hmm. which brings me to sort of some vague history of science remembrances about Newton and uh, uh, Einstein. 
neither of which said, oh, I figured out how it works through God. Right. Both of them said, oh, I've been allowed to figure out how it works. Praise God. <laughs> right. I, I like that. <laughs> Sheila, go ahead. You'll find this happening to you. You have the temple having a picnic, <laughs> and the clouds are dark, and they'll say, Rabbi, don't you have connections? Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Put it all in a favor, yeah. But it, it's also you want rain, and somebody else not want the rain. Good. <laughs> in other words, we say, okay, you know, one of our favorite expressions always is, it should rain during the night when I'm sleeping. Right. right. And yeah. they forget there are people traveling at night. Good. So, yeah. Sheila, this is the perfect segue, but I do want to hear Nelson. But keep that in mind, because that's where we're going next. Nelson. Unmute. I have to unmute. Well, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not muted anymore. Um, well, two things, uh, maybe. Uh, one is, uh, I, I think of uh, Moses asking God to see his see his face on the mountain. Uh -huh. And God says, no, no one can see my face and live, uh -huh. but I'll, I'll pass behind you. So there's a, some, there's a limitation to what God can do. And what we could perceive, yeah. There are so, limitations to what we think God can do. Can be sure. Um, but he says, I... You can't see my face and live. So he, anyway, but, but the point Please, is God is that, limited because God that there. Well, certainly what's more obvious there is that we're limited, right? That we can't look on God's face and live. But you're making the argument that it actually speaks to God's limitation because God can't be received without God's creation. No, he dying. can't show us his face. He can show us his back. Okay, so that's... A, he can't okay. show us his face. Interesting. Okay, keep going. Um, hmm. The other part is that uh, I, I see the Honey story about negotiation. When you're desperate, you may settle for the first thing you get. Uh -huh. uh, Abraham didn't do that. Um, but uh, Honey didn't either. He said, no, not too little, too much. He... he negotiates his way to the right amount or, or tries to. Uh -huh. And, and uh, that's a lesson for us when we're desperate. Good. Don't take yeah, the I think first thing you're yeah. offered. Good. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, okay, Lois, then we're going to move on. Just one more. So, I'm not relevant to this, but there's really no mention of thanks. Like he doesn't say, well, thank you for giving me just a little trickle of rain, but we really want more or, you know, there's really no acknowledgement that I appreciate what you've done, but it's not exactly what I wanted. Right. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Where's the gratefulness? Where's the gratitude? And it was negotiation. It was a sort of, it was bargaining, but there was a, a negotiation with God. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. meant troublesome sometimes. The other thing is the trickle, if it lasted long enough, probably would have been fine. Right. So maybe there's there impatience. 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 Good. I want to keep going, go back to what you said. So what we're going to be doing as we move through these texts today is widening our circle, right? We have the Pony uh, Amagel who draws the circle around just himself. And maybe there's this interconnectivity between God and people in a certain way where like God needs to act a certain way in order for us to continue to live and praise God, right? The praise can only come if we, if we survive. So there's that interconnectivity, but I, but then there's that. Uh, where is the where is the consideration of other people? The sort of selfish request of rain when it's when I'm sleeping, right? How does that? Where is the circle being wide enough to not just span one person but a whole community? So who wants to read the next one? Go for it. Traveling along a road when it began to rain, I said before God, Master of the Universe. The entire world is comfortable, but Hanina is suffering. The rain ceased. When he arrived at his home, he said before God, Master of the universe, the entire world is suffering, and Hanina is comfortable. Uh -huh. The rain began to fall. Uh -huh. <laughs> so again, you have this interesting relationship with God, where God, again, listens to this rabbi and, and I think maybe it's because they had merit, right? In, in in the world that we're living in here, the Talmudic world, but God responds to to these great rabbis who have merit, perhaps, right? That's not to say that all their prayers are always answered, but certainly when it comes to rain, there's some interesting, maybe that goes back to like behavior and rain. But but first, 
it's raining on him. And he said, no, everybody's comfortable in their own homes, but I'm stuck out in the rain. So God listens and, and stops the rain. But then at home, he realizes what I should be comfortable and everybody else uncomfortable because they need rain to survive. And so God brings the rain again. David. So one of the things this reminds me of, and I, I think we actually did study this in, a, in another context, studying with a different group, this tractate. The rabbi who taught that um, would would talk about see the great merit of the one of these amazing sages. Some of us roll our eyes a little bit and say, "Okay, we can accept that at a certain level." But on the other hand, isn't it possible that these are build up the rabbi stories? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Build up words, the rabbis. Sorry. In other words, we we want the great sage to be great. One of the ways we make the great sage great is the walls of the study hall don't completely collapse because of his merit, or the rain comes and goes because of his merit, yeah. or all of these kinds of stories about merit, which is not to say there wasn't merit because we're still studying what these guys right. said. Maybe that's the ultimate merit right. in a sense. Um. But somehow, the way the stories are constructed, whether this has anything to do with uh, the influence of uh, the surrounding Persians or not, I don't really know, but it's a theory. Um, they follow a certain pattern right. about if, if just in case you didn't think the guy was a sage already, right. oh, look what he can do or what happens because of his merit. Well, there's no question that that's all over Talmud, where the rabbis sort of inflate their own influence. Uh, so, for instance, there are times where rabbis have discussions with, you know, the, the emperor, and the emperor is bested in this Torah debate and accepts the rabbi's Torah ruling. Right? Same thing with like the, the Uzari Yehuda Halevi, where the the king converts based on the the um, unassailable. Uh, uh, proof and logical uh, rationalism of Judaism, right? So again, it's sort of like, wow, would that actually happen? And 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 you know, although that was based in some truth, but but um, so yeah, I think that the the rabbis here with God too are sort of inflating how much influence they actually. And have. And we do have time. this curious uh, context in Babel of being surrounded by Zoroastrian Persians who have their magi. Mm -hmm. who are their, uh, um, I won't exactly call them sages per se, but they're practicers of, of magic that works because they either have a greater understanding or a closer connection to whatever the powers are that allow that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's where the rabbis were going at all because yeah. they clearly weren't. They were probably literally resisting that kind of thing yeah. among a population that might be more assimilated than they themselves mm -hmm. were. But nevertheless, they perhaps are borrowing some of the literary style of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a good theory. What I find interesting is, did the rain stop everywhere? Or did the rain stop only above Verzina? Uh -huh. And then and later on, does it restart for everybody because he's home? So. Do we have any idea which of those two it is? <laughs> it's a great question. I feel like it's here in this story, and it's open for interpretation, obviously, but I, I almost feel like it's sort of like an all or nothing light switch here because the premise is that it's this we're all interconnected. That that when he's home, if it was just over his head, there'd be no there'd be no issue because other people wouldn't be um wouldn't be suffering for his lack of for his right. staying dry. But here it seems to be when he's home, saying, why should I be comfortable while everybody else is suffering from the lack of rain? So I think of it as like a light switch that's just like rain everywhere or rain not. It's like on, on television. They said, they, you know. <laughs> the storm cloud following your head. Then the, the, the snow and the rain. Yeah. And then there's, you know, I did this morning, I think they were showing pictures of the uh, ski resorts mm -hmm. that are suffering. Right. Oh, right, exactly right. Yeah. Right. I was going to kind of argue against what David was talking about as a build up the rabbi and show the merit. I think it would show more merit on his part if he sort of had this second thought and regret 
somewhere in between when the rain stopped and when he got through his front door. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> now that I'm fine, like, okay, go ahead. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, I think it took just, a little while. That's a good point. And I guess to refine what I'm saying based on what you just said is, I think it's it's like hero literature because it should say what you said, but it doesn't. No. Mm. Yeah, right. No, they're, they're by no means perfect or infallible. Like they, it's very, rabbinic literature is very much grounded in reality, even when it goes to the fanciful or extremes, right? It depicts mm-hmm. real life. And that's what some of the beauty of it, that people in their flaws. I, I don't think it wants to, you know, what's it, the pockmark thing? Like, like not show the pockmark, like the George Washington portrait where some people, oh, yeah. you know, do you show him with his pockmarked skin or do you, you know, glaze over, over them? We <laughs> yeah. don't pretend that Reish Lachish was never a highwayman. Right, exactly. He was a bandit turned scholar. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's interesting to me though the way this narrative goes because it doesn't say that God answered what Rabbi Hanina said. He just said the rain <laughs> stopped. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's true. I mean, rain stops. And go, you know, I, I was struck by how beautiful the weather was when we went to DC mm-hmm. for you know, and they, they, there was yeah. weather wasn't so great was before and so great yeah. after. Yeah. And yeah. do we think that was because of our mm-hmm. action in, in or you know or, yeah. that we yeah? <laughs> or is it just is this are we just seeing it from Hanina's yeah. point of view like Oh man, I'm lucky it stopped raining before I got home, and now I'm home. Oh, no, look, and it's raining again. You know. Well, I think what I'm hearing. Okay, oh, go yeah, no, it's what, what you're. What I'm hearing and what you're saying is also just perspective, right? Like for instance, when when Alex and I got married, which was in Cleveland, it had rained three. We, it was on a Sunday. Three of the Sundays out of four, it <laughs> rained, and our wedding was outside. <laughs> the one Sunday it didn't rain was our wedding, and we were blessed and lucky about that. Flash forward to Alex and I are co-officiating a wedding in Park City, Utah, beautiful place. And it starts raining on the, and it was also outdoors and it, they needed a contingency plan B. And Alex feeds me a line, which is one of the benefits of, of having such a brilliant rabbi as a partner. And she says, rain is one, because they're obviously so upset, the couple, that they can't be outside. And she said, you should start by saying that, you know, rain is one of the few ways in which heaven and earth meet. You know, like get, reframe it in a positive. So, but but that comes to perspective. On one hand, how oh how blessed we were that it didn't rain on our wedding. But then in another situation, how blessed you are that it rained on your wedding. Right, yeah. this is not saying hello. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. In the end, it, it also comes down to perspective. Right. We think of rain as actually being blessed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It is. Right. Rain certainly do. Is it a, do you know, uh, oh, yes. 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 That's lovely. Yes. But the perspective yes. point brings us back to our theme for today about the widening the circle, right? Is it is it just, you know, your concern over are you are you getting wet and, uh, you know, and uncomfortable or now or is it just this like mano y mano with God or do you expand that circle now to include other people, everybody, right? It, it's Rain is a is a natural cycle that impacts all of us. Like in one place, it could be rainy and snowy and beautiful. Another place could be suffering. And and how do we how do we recognize the interconnectivity of all connected through rain and through snow? So let's continue on with one final. Again, this is also from Pa'anit. We have another text after this, but this is going to continue to expand our circle. Who wants to read? And uh, Zoomers can also volunteer to read, of course. Continue. Okay, go for it. Thanks. He was walking along the road when he saw this. This, by the way, sorry, sorry, I should have said this is this still Tony. This is Tony Hamagel, the circle. Mate. So now we're returning to him in a different story, which you may be familiar with at the beginning, especially with uh, Tu Bishvat coming up. But uh, you may not be as familiar with the context and how this story continues. So, okay, go ahead, please. He was walking along the road when he saw a man planting a carob tree. Tony said to him, This tree. After how many years will it bear fruit? The man said to him, it will not produce fruit until 70 years have passed. Honey said to him, is it obvious to you that you will live 70 years that you expect to benefit from this tree? He said to him, I found a world full of carob trees. Just as my ancestors planted for me, I too am planting for my descendants. Honey sat and ate bread. 
Sleep overcame him and he slept. A cliff formed around him and he disappeared from sight and slept for 70 years. When he awoke, he saw a man gathering carobs from that tree. Honey said to him, are you the one who planted this tree? The man said to him, I am his son's son. Honey went home and said to the members of the household, is the son of Amigel alive? They said to him, his son is no longer with us, but his son's son is alive. He said to them, I am Honi Hamegel. They did not believe him. He went to the study hall where he heard the sages say about one scholar, his halachot is lightning and as clear as the years of Honi Hamegel. Or when he would enter the study hall, he would resolve for the sages any difficulty they had. Honi said to them, I am he. But they did not believe him and did not pay him proper respect. Honey became very upset, prayed for mercy, oh, and died. <laughs> Rava said, this explains the folk saying that people say either friendship or death. Good. So a lot going on here, right? First, we have the classic story of the man planting the carob tree. And Honey says, why are you doing this? You won't benefit from it. Well, I came into a world that had plenty of fruit trees, of carob trees that I could benefit from. I'm planting for the next generation. So this is expanding our circle, not just you and God, not just you and other people, but you and people not yet born, right? Future generations, which of course is why it's such an effective Tu uh, uh story. It's why you're such an environmentalist. It's why I, I really care about sustainability and I'm proud of the, the moves mm -hmm. Spanation is making on that front. Um, exactly. And then it keeps going, right? So Pony then uh, falls to sleep for 70 years. And this, there's a, a, a Greek tale that may have influenced this of another, I'm forgetting his name, but a, a Greek who is asleep for 70 years, it's a similar structure. So they think maybe there was some influence here. This is our Jewish <laughs> version of it, if anybody knows, but I, yeah. Um, so Van Winkle? Yeah. You know, that, that's similar, and, also, and Rip Van Winkle also, it's all in the same line of influence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, so he goes to sleep for 70 years, sort of like frozen in time, right? Then wakes up and no, he no longer knows anybody. You know, his generation has passed on uh, uh, to the point where, right, obviously he sees the grandson enjoying the carob tree. So now he understands what was behind the planting. But then later he goes back to the Bay Midrash, which was surely a place where he can still be, you know, relevant and, and that's his home. And and he is not recognized there, and they don't believe him when they say that he was this great scholar, Phony Amagel. And so he's so lonely, right? Because nobody, he doesn't have any more social contacts, contacts that, that he prays again, this time, just like he prayed in the first story for God's mercy and God, mm -hmm. and God brought the rain. He is now praying for mercy in the form of death, which God again answers, uh, and he dies. And Rava said, this explains the folk saying that people say either friendship or death. What? So, so again, what speaking to the importance of inter, the interconnectivity of all things and what happens when your circle only is, is you know, surrounds you and there's no one else in that circle. Very sad. Yes. Something else hit me, and that is, it's like saying, Get lost or retire early. Get lost. You're oh too old and stop. Stop requesting or demanding things because you're past. Mm. Uh, you know, old people want the same respect and honor that they had when they had their former positions, mm -hmm. and um, they don't get it because the young people don't know them, mm. and, and they. It's true. I mean, we talked about this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a really interesting read of this, and I think that perhaps if Honi had approached as somebody else, not claiming to be Honi, then he probably would have been met more favorably with like, oh, you know, maybe come on in, and then he could prove his scholarship and could have started anew. But I, I think what I'm reading in this is that they just didn't believe him; thought he was some crazy liar because he was claiming yeah, to be. Because there is something unbelievable in this story that he yeah. is frozen in time for 70 yeah. years, right? So you would have the same reaction. Say, what are you talking about? That's impossible. You're not Elvis. Or, you know, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
it's a good one. Right, but uh, but so but but I I but I think your read of it is a really interesting one that still holds true about how do we treat our elders, how do we treat I, the retirees who who are trying to still you know have influence in the field that they excelled in. I was thinking when we talked about Honey before and praying wasn't enough that he took action and drew this in. I, I didn't read Prayed for Mercy as praying for the mercy of death. It was just a help me here. Oh. And he didn't take any action. He said, I'm Honey, here I am. But he didn't exhibit any of the scholarship or interpretation that had won him all this respect 70 years ago. So had he taken some action and tried to become a part of their discussion, mm. That might have been a very different level of connectedness. Change the story. Okay, so I'm seeing an inversion of with the first story that in the first story he didn't just pray, he acted, but in this story he prayed and didn't act. Well, he, he, he came and said, "I'm Honey." They said, "No, you're not," and he's like, "God help me." Right. I'm done here. That's really interesting. So maybe he lost that insight that led to his success in the first story and his failure in the second. And I'll just say to this: there are different versions of this story. So in the in the Yerushalmi and the Jerusalem Talmud. He they do ask for proof. They said, Well, when Honi was alive, they the this part of the temple used to illuminate when he would walk by, and then he does and it illuminates. So it has a, a much different ending where he actually does prove that it's him and they believe him. But in the in the Bavli, it's a, sounds it's a like sad the ending. Like the oven. Sounds like the oven story. No, no, but this is a, this is very oven. much like yeah. the uh yeah. um, Moses yeah. and Rabbi Akiva story. Uh -huh. It's exactly the same. <laughs> Moses gets there and he's who is he? Right. He's a nobody. Um, until they well, say. back row. Right. Because he was a nobody. Well, that's understood, but there, there seems to be a theme here. Yeah, no, that's an interesting <laughs> point because in, in that story, Moses is comforted that at least they're teaching in his name. Like at least he had a legacy, right? Mm -hmm. The best <laughs> legacy. And here he could have been satisfied with the legacy because they're saying you're not Pony Amagel. He, you know, he was such a bright light. And uh uh here he could have been satisfied with, okay, they don't believe me, but at least my legacy lives on. But for him, it stopped short. So maybe I, I still, I think this circle drawer, I, I, I'm reading, and I don't mean to read him unfavorably, but I think it it begins and ends in his own experience. And I think he should have been comforted that something lives beyond him, right? His legacy, his students, his scholarship, but he can't break that inner circle, which I think is interesting. Ruth, do you have your hand? I'm looking at the last verse. Chavruta mm. omituta is the loneliness of the old person. Mm. Yeah. Doesn't have anybody around him that recognizes him. Mm. So he'd rather be dead. Yeah. Right. And he and doesn't ask for death to die. He asks for mercy. But I think right. you, I think you could interpret it either way. I think you're fair to say he's not asking for death. I think you could also read into it that he is. But uh but uh, but I just want to say uh Chavruta or mituta, right? Uh, friendship or death? Mm -hmm. Chavruta, right? Which we're familiar with is in the context of Torah scholarship, that Torah is best learned mm -hmm. like this, right? In mm -hmm. companionship, either, you know, a, a partnership of yeah, two who are learned together or a group. Yourself, of course. Um, but so what does that say in the, in the sense of the transmission of Torah, that, that he didn't have a chavruta? Mm -hmm. He didn't have somebody to learn Torah with. And so he died. He died. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I'm going to take this, I think, in a different direction, because I think there's a certain poignancy and tragedy in that here's this great scholar, Honey, who can't see the value of planting a carob tree for the future. And the way he has to learn that lesson is for 70 years, however much he would have lived, um, had none of this happened. Nobody benefits from his scholarship. And then when he's back in the wrong time, nobody benefits from his scholarship, and he's literally finished by the end of the story. Uh, so in some sense, maybe the story is also a warning that somebody like Tony, who gave us all this scholarship, can be this, I'll say, self-absorbed, maybe Maybe that's the point of only one person in the circle. Oh, right. You could choose to be. Um, you know, how much more so could we be in trouble if we follow him down that wrong path? 
Good. Yeah, I think so. And 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 in the context, going back to the Torah as a tree of life, right? Or this carob tree that we plant for the next generation. And it's not about us. It's about it's about the transmission of Torah. It's about keeping the door of a door, right? Judaism alive through the generations. For him, it wasn't enough that the tree of life was being sustained for the next generation. That there, the Beit Midrash was strong and thriving, but that wasn't enough to comfort him because he was not recognized and he did the honor wasn't afforded him. So that maybe that idea of like, you know, to 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 see Judaism as this ultimately, you know, should be a selfless enterprise where it's it's bigger than any one person. It's about the transmission from door to door, the roots, right? That the tree of life is sustained and that's what matters. The, the, the Torah as a tree of life, yeah. Well, Christianity has its own version of this. In other words, the stories mm -hmm. about the second coming and Jesus comes mm -hmm. and he's crucified again mm -hmm. because no one recognizes him for right. who he was. Right. When the miracle of 34th Street, right? Yeah. <laughs> the same story yeah like this guy that they think is a nut right, right. who says tells them he's santa claus he's and then uh the reveal at the end that well wait wait maybe he was yeah something. maybe i'm not such a great lawyer after yeah. all <laughs> yeah i think another way to look at this after you know studying recently about you know the dreams of joe you know maybe this was all a dream mm -hmm. that he went uh -huh. you know he, he was you know when when we have dreams I, I can always trace back, well, what happened that day that I'm dreaming this? Like someone yeah. says something about someone, suddenly they're in my dream that night. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this guy tells him about the carob tree 70 years. He goes to sleep, he dreams this. Mm -hmm. And then maybe this is just a lesson to him, but well, what can I do now during my lifetime mm -hmm. to, you know, make sure that Torah or whatever will be around for generations? Sort of like it's a wonderful and This is life really just a, you know, a <laughs> metaphor. Yeah. Where yeah. No, and I think that's really good, uh, especially because in the in the Yerushalmi, in the different version uh, in, it, of this story, the verse that they go to is, when we return to Zion, we will have been like dreamers. Right? Mm -hmm. It's saying that because he didn't understand that verse until the dream and, and all that, or, or until he went to sleep for 70 years. But <laughs> But I think the dream connection is made. I don't think they say that this is necessarily a dream, but they invoke that verse. That's interesting. Any other thoughts before our final? I, I want to go back to okay. you know, says, only, only sat and ate bread. Without having read the rest of it first, when I first saw that, I said, oh, he was satisfied with the answer. He sat down and he ate. Mm -hmm. What was the big deal? And then you get this whole other thing. Right. <laughs> well, the bread made him sleepy. That's why you shouldn't eat too much. Uh, Nelson, yeah. Nelson? In the first yeah. story, he speaks for the people. And mm. that's what I think gives him an, an, an entry to God. But here in this story, he doesn't. He speaks for himself. Nice. Mm -hmm. Right. What What is enduring and, and what ultimately not, right? When you're... Yeah, but God answers anything. Yeah, that's true. And maybe, maybe a sort of, yeah, in a darker way. Yeah. Right. Well, I think there's still this special relationship between them. <laughs> um, okay, I want to transition to our final text here. So we've talked all about rain, but it's snowing out, and we haven't talked about <laughs> snow yet. So I want to bring oh, it's lovely. The Dead oh, by James lovely. Joyce from the Dublin collection, The Dubliners. Um, but just a bit of context. So the story goes, um, Gabriel goes to this dinner party, and there's a moment where um, his wife, Greta, is entranced by a song that's played. And he's looking at her being entranced by this song and he's overcome with attraction for her, with, with this, this longing for her. And you don't know what her reaction to the song was until later, on, I guess on their way home, uh, she tells him that it was actually a previous man in her life, uh, Nick, you're, uh, sorry, that's, that's the- um, Great day. That's, <laughs> Uh, oh, is that that's a uh, no? You were going. I'm thinking for, uh, the Avengers. The Avengers. Yeah, <laughs> but Nick, that is also Nick. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> I forget the Gatsby Nick is Nick. Nice. I'm forgetting. Uh, we gotta look that up. Michael Fury. Michael Fury is this previous man in in her life who had set, who had sung her this song. Uh, and she had loved him, and he actually died uh, uh, 
freezing to death outside her door, like waiting for her. So there's this there's this way in which the past is irrestricable from the present, which which comes uh, uh, to sort of throw the Gabriel off because in the dinner party he had had a conversation about how oh I don't really love I, this takes place in Ireland so I, I don't really love Ireland this sort of feeling of like I'm not bound to this place or to my past I like only the present matters but then he's hit with this rude awakening realization that you're you cannot completely break yourself from the ties of the past sure. the way that his wife is still <laughs> entranced by the dead this man from the past. Um, so let's read this text. Who wants to read? Go for it. Snow was general all over. It was falling softly upon the bog of Allen and further westwards, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling too upon every part of the lonely churchyard where Father, where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe, and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. Well, that's James Joyce. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we talked about rain being this symbol of interconnectivity of all things, that we're all dependent on rain. There's the rain cycle that one part of the world is affected by how much rain and the other part of the world, right? All this interconnectivity. But snow also has that same relevance and impact, uh, but in the form of a sort of like, it falls equally on the living and the dead. It's something that connects and sort of freezes in time. We talked about how Pony is sort of frozen in time for 70 years, but, but how... Mm -hmm how uh, uh, there is this blanket of snow that sort of preserves and freezes in time, but also that 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 connects the living and the dead. And I, so if we're expanding our circles right throughout all these texts, first we had your own personal circle or maybe like a one-on-one -on -one with God, that opens up to community, right? Recognizing that you're not just alone, but but in community, uh, give me Kavruta or or give me death, right? And then uh, expand that more to this, not just the people who are living in your current generation, but the next generation, right? Expanding our circle as Jews, Lador Vador, to care very much as we do about what comes after us and how we keep the tree of life, Torah, flourishing and alive for generations to come. But then maybe there's this one last final circle too, which is not just us and those not yet born, but us and those who have come before us to widen this circle one layer more and how rain and snow helps us think about the interconnectivity of all things. Mm. So any, any reactions to this final text or just everything we've touched on? Lovely. You did it right. <laughs> Their last end, it says. Their last end upon all the living. living and the dead, very powerful. So that's the end of days. You know, I, I was struck by that too, that, that like the descent of their last end. And I wasn't sure what it was referring to. It may just be the following of the snow. Choices are difficult that way. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is sort of apocalyptic or, or going to the end of days. Could be. Well, I mean, certainly one way of understanding the reference is it's referring to the living and the dead. What if it's referring to the snow itself? That would be harder probably, at least for me. So if anybody has an insight on that one, I'm all ears. It falls yeah. equally on the just and the unjust. Say that, Say that again, Jackie. A what on the just and the unjust? It falls equally yeah. on the and the unjust. Right. So this sort of indiscriminate. So going back sort of as a counter to what we were saying before about through merit and behavior, we, we get rain. But here's sort of the opposite, where actually it, it falls on the worthy and the unworthy of this alike, because it doesn't just stop at one person. I, I just heard from what Jackie said. I just heard. I just heard uh, Kushner. Hmm. Why? Why good things happen to bad people? Like what, you yeah, know, it comes what, up a lot. Yeah. What, what, what did I just say? Yeah. When bad why things bad things happen, 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 happen to good people? Yeah. 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 It's it's why. Good things happen to bad people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they got the snow too. Right, right, exactly. Or the rain. Yeah. He did pretty recently.
Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Sheila would know. Yeah, yeah Rabbi Kushner died recently. Yeah. So I just want to end there with, with this idea of how rain and snow can heighten our appreciation for and sensitivity to the interconnectivity of all things, how that makes us better Jews, um, and, and all the different rings, right? All of them are important. It's not that we keep getting better and better as we open the circle. I think all, all of them are important. Your own is paramount, right? How, you need the oxygen mask before you can help others, right? So the importance of that ring, uh, and also in the context of like a personal relationship with God, you know, and then expanding that ring to community, right? It's never enough to end it yourself. Um, and then beyond that, the generations to come, what can we do, which is a, is a good segue to uh, composting the food scraps and the plates, but not the cups. And then, uh, and then, but also those who came before us, right? As Jews, we're always aware of, of where we come from and, and this tree that has roots that go so far into the ground. Um, to you know, to continue this this Torah as a tree of life, Lador Vador. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the thank snow. You.